Hello and welcome. This podcast is conversations with and for dispute resolution professionals. So please follow the podcast and I really hope you enjoy the conversation. In today's session, Director of Applied Learning for Mediation Institute, Ken Speakman, is talking with Venita Demos. Benita is a dispute resolution professional with a passion for coaching and supporting people to understand how to improve their response to conflict. Good morning, Venita. How are you this morning? I'm well, thanks, Ken. That's good, and I'm glad you had the time to talk to us here today. Now, for those who don't know Venita, um, she's a lawyer, she's also a mediator and a conflict specialist. And today I want to talk about your path from the very beginning to what brought you to this point in time. So you can start us off, if you could, by telling us what got you involved with conflict. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Well, I started my career as a lawyer. My father was a lawyer and um, at the time I really felt a real connection to the legal industry and I spent over 20 years practicing as a lawyer and I, I absolutely loved it. Uh, But during that process, working as a lawyer, you are working with people in conflict every day. So I started developing a real interest in conflict resolution and conflict skills. What sort of lawyer were you? I started off as a corporate lawyer working for ANZ. I then went to private practice specialising in banking and finance and corporate law uh, and then moved into insurance and superannuation. And then decided to become a mediator. So I did a one-year diploma of family mediation and set up my own company, the mediation company. And from then, I really realised how little people know about conflict. Mm. It's it's in our lives every day. You know, we can't really avoid it. It's something people don't really like. Um, But it it tends to rear its ugly head when we least expect it, doesn't it? It certainly does. And and conflict something, as you said, it's, it's more so unavoidable. Um, and people just don't know how it starts nine times out of ten and don't know how to finish it and get get rid of it out of their lives. And I don't mean the person, I mean the conflict. Yes, I agree, and that was certainly my observation as I got into doing mediations. I specialised in family and workplace mediations, and what I, what I was finding is that people most of the time really did have a good intention. They didn't really set out to maliciously hurt another person. It was just this real lack of education and lack of training because, I mean, how many of us have actually undergone formal training in conflict resolution? Not that many. Not that many. You know, at school we learn to read, to write, to talk, but we don't necessarily learn those key skills that we need that help us in situations of conflict. And so I started developing an interest and in the last seven years I've thrown myself into research, further study and further training into conflict. I've um, studied with the Neuroleadership Institute and uh, obtained certifications in brain-based coaching, brain-based conversation skills. I've also uh, become a conflict coach and done a certificate in conflict dynamics profiling, which is a really interesting process. I don't know, Ken, whether you've heard about assessment tools that are used in HR, such as Myers-Briggs, personality type assessment? Yes, my Briggs, I'm very aware of, but can you just go back to this brain um, coaching you did? Sure. So uh, the brain-based coaching talks about the intersect of the neuroscience of our brain and uh, our social skills as human beings. So there's a very tight link between our brain, which governs everything that we say and do and mm-hmm. think, and how we react and respond to other people. Can you unpack that a bit more? Because I'm, I'm sure that a lot of people listening won't understand what the training is about. Absolutely, and certainly I didn't know what it was about before I did it either. Um, but when we are in conflict, our brain has a survival mechanism. And mm-hmm. what happens is when we're feeling triggered in conflict, our brain and our body react in a similar way as being under threat physically. So if you think about early caveman days and you're about to be attacked by a wild beast and suddenly you have what we call an amygdala response or an amygdala hijack, which is when your logical part of your brain basically shuts down and you go into this 
stress response, you might have heard it as being fight, flight or freeze. Yeah, that's, when the, that's when the sympathetic nervous system takes over. Exactly. We get increased cortisol, our muscles tighten, our breathing becomes shallow and we really are preparing for a fight. And the neuroscience shows that we have the same physical response to a physical threat, like being attacked by a wild beast, as a social threat, which is a situation where someone's attacking you or you're perceived to be attacked in conflict. So we have this really intense reaction in our brain. It's automatic, it's subconscious, we don't get much notice of it, you know, a matter of seconds. And suddenly our lo logical and cognitive part of our brain shuts down. And we're in this space where we're fighting for our survival, so to speak. So have you ever had a situation, Ken, where you've been in an argument and you might have said something that you've later regretted? And don't ne say no. Never, <laughs> never, never. <laughs> never. <laughs> I've ever, I never, ever. Um, yeah, I, I, it has happened, yes, yes. Yeah, and you know, the worst thing about knowing about it is sometimes you do it and you're aware you're about to do it and you kind of go, stop, stop. You know, I don't want to do it. And so you say something that at the time really feels right to you, but later on, an hour down the track, a day or a week, you kind of go, I wish I hadn't said that. And that, that is your brain shutting down, preparing you for survival. At that point in time, there is little or no cognitive capacity, little or no capacity to analyse a situation, to pre-prepare a response. You just basically react. And that's mm. where we get those situations of escalated conflict. And that fear will trigger that response as well. Yeah, absolutely. So social threat is huge and there have been studies into it. So, you know, David Rock from the Neuroleadership Institute has a, something called the SCARF model and he talks about the five social threats that can really make us feel threatened and volatile in that sense. And there's situations, for example, it could be a social threat like feeling like you're not belonging. It could be a lack of certainty. It could be a lack of status, how you perceive yourself. Um, you know, it could be all those things. So that's what we're finding now in COVID, particularly globally. Most people are really uh, under, under threat of their, their certainty. We don't know what this pandemic is going to bring. So there's a real lack of certainty. And of course, with the lockdown, there's been a real lack of connection. And when we see those needs not being met, um, they're a threat to us as, as human beings, as social creatures. And that can cause us to operate at a level where we're not operating as logically or cognitively as we should be or we normally are, so to speak. Mm. Oh, it's so true. Yeah. Um, we see it every day in conflict with mediation. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, particularly in workplace mediations, I started noticing the more workplace coaching I did that a lot of these situations really were driven by people's um, fear or social threat. For example, you know, if you look at something like a status threat, a status threat is a threat to how you think you are perceived by other people or how you perceive yourself. And if you're in a situation where you're feeling like you're micromanaged or perhaps you feel your job's on the line or, you know, deep down perhaps you're insecure and you don't think you're doing a good job, like, you know, we refer to it as the imposter syndrome sometimes, yeah. what happens is when you're in, operating at that level of social threat, you tend to feel more vulnerable, more stressed, and then you basically project that onto other people. So we might get managers micromanaging other people, for example, because they're not managing that threat in themselves properly. Yeah, projection's a big thing. I did a talk with uh, Joanne on projections not that long ago. Um, and with the NLP side of the world, which is a neuro-linguistic programming side of the world, people project when they don't have the, the piece of the puzzle of how that person will react. So I project into that person how they would react. Yeah, absolutely. So we see that um, in situations in families, for example, um, when there's been family violence and, you know, the offenders are, are projecting, you know, they've got these deep, deep feelings inside themselves. I don't know whether you've heard the saying, hurt people hurt people. Have you heard Yeah, that? I have. I've heard that one, yeah. yeah. So basically when we are grappling internally and we're in internal turmoil, we do project on other people. It takes an incredible amount of self-reflection and insight to really understand yourself and your own triggers. You know, the default mechanism is so 
often projecting on other people. In, in another one of the ones we, um, we did as well on perceptions, um, everyone has different perceptions of the, the world. There's no two identical. Absolutely. Um, when they get out of whack, that's when conflict can also start. Yes, of course. You're, you know, you're absolutely right because our brains are firing off neurons every day. So every thought we have, every action we have, you know, it's a neuron. And when we have these limiting beliefs or perceptions about people or about the world, you know, we have almost, if you think about it, like a, a preconceived neuron in our brain and our brain fires off that neuron because we have limited beliefs. So if I had a limited belief about you, Let's say I was working with you and I had a limited belief that you didn't like me. I would on a subconscious level be looking for evidence or proof that you don't like me every day that we interact and I'd be and, looking for that. And of course, the more you look for something, the more you'll find it and it may not be true. Absolutely. I mean, that explains why, you know, sometimes you, know, you might decide to buy a new car, for example. Let's say you decide that you're going to buy a yellow BMW and you are actually subconsciously looking on the road and suddenly... You know, you can see, well, actually, that's not a good example because there's not many yellow BMWs. But let's say you chose a black BMW, you subconsciously look for that. I'll, I'll interrupt just for a second here. When they first came out not long ago, the new version of Mustang. Oh, yeah. I thought, oh, my God, it's a beautiful car. I mean, I'd love to have one of those. Then I started looking for them and I saw them every five seconds. And I Everywhere. thought, no, too common, don't want it. Exactly. Um, but before I made that decision to, to look for them, you'd never see them. You're absolutely right. That's our brain's reticular activating system at work because our brain has a filter. It's a bit like the spam filter on your email. You put on your spam filter and it filters out what you don't want to see. So exactly. all, our brain is taking millions and millions of bits of data from our surrounding environments and it's got to find a way to filter those in and out. And it well, it can't fit them all in because that becomes a map, doesn't it? It becomes a well, map of reality. It doesn't become so reality itself. You'd be overwhelmed. So neurologically, exactly. there's actually a mechanism in your brain where neurologically it filters in the things you're looking for. I remember when I was renovating my bathroom, going to my friend's house and I came out and I went to her bathroom and I said, gosh, I love your tiles. You know, your bathroom looks beautiful. And she looked at me and said, Vanita, I've had those for over 10 years. You've been to my house hundreds of times. <laughs> I've never noticed them before. You know, women that are trying to get pregnant and can't have children report that everywhere they look, there's people in prams. Yeah, exactly. Before they don't notice them, they're invisible because they're not part of our filters to, to look for. That's now, right. Now, with regards yeah. to perceptions, um, the way I try to operate, and it doesn't always work, of course, is when I come to a perceptual difference with someone, I'm more now curious to why the difference rather than confronted by it. That's incredible, and that is the essence of good coaching, Ken. It's developing that true empathy. You know, we, we talk about empathy as being stepping into other people's shoes, but it's actually so much more than that. It's not judging them by your perception. It's actually being able to step into their shoes and feel what they're actually feeling. It's I'm more really confrontational. I just sort of ask, well, okay, we're obviously going to disagree with here over this. I'm curious to why this is a, a factor for you. Absolutely. I want to learn. Can you tell me why? Yeah, and you know, I call that authentic curiosity. You're really curious to see why someone is thinking that or feeling that because it's, you know, it's because it's something that you don't understand in them. It's possibly something they don't even understand in themselves. And on the same token, I may then learn something and go, well, that's great. I've now learned something. Or I might find a fault in it and I'll try and explain my side calmly and coolly to see if we can find some common ground. And you've hit the nail on the head because by listening to someone with curiosity, you're listening to learn. You're listening to learn about them. Whereas what, what we tend to do in conflict is we listen to defend. We want to defend ourselves. In we mediation, listen. the way I explain it to students is we active listening is listening to understand rather than listening to respond. That's right because most of us when we listen, we're hearing but we're not actually listening because our brains are preparing a response in advance. Or, you know, when you listen to someone, you kind of go, oh, look, I know what they're going to say. I just know what they're going to say. And you're preparing what you're going to say back. Um, and you know, how often does that come true? Never. No. And, you know, did you know that our brain has something like over 46 thoughts 
per minute. Per minute. And I, I guarantee you, even listening to this podcast for however long we're going on for, you know, we, we, people are going to have hundreds of thoughts and I guarantee you it's not going to be just this podcast. They might be hearing to us, uh, hearing us, but, you know, anyone listening, just have a piece of paper with you and write down some random thoughts that pop up while you're listening to us and you'll be really surprised at the results. That's a, a good statement, yeah. I agree totally with that. Mm. Take notice what comes into your mind, how relevant it is, it's, it's regardless. Just write it down, make a note, and at the end of it, see how it all fits together. Yeah. Now, moving on a little bit, um, thank you for that little chat. That's fantastic. I really enjoyed it. I mean, I could talk to you on this subject all day, but oh, unfortunately, people won't I. listen all day. <laughs> um, moving on now, so what sort of training have you done apart from the brain stuff and you then went into, what was it again? Conflict Dynamics Profiling. So we, we started talking about Myers-Briggs. Yeah, and, Maya Briggs, yeah. yeah. And Gallup Strength Training. And a lot of organisations have this assessment software that kind of test your personality and a lot of recruiting companies use it for candidate selection when they're recruiting. So um, what's your Maya Briggs profile? So, oh, well, um, gosh, I can't remember. I did that years ago, but I can tell you my conflict dynamic profile. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's making me really vulnerable. So I've trained in conflict dynamic profiling, which is a system that's been around for years and years. The Eckerd College in the U.S., developed an assessment that actually assesses you for your conflict dynamics. So, for example, it'll give you what are your constructive conflict behaviours, what are your destructive conflict behaviours, and what are your hot buttons? Because we all have triggers, Ken. We yep. all have individual triggers. And there's no point saying, I don't have any or I'm going to aim to never have any. It's just not about that. We are human social creatures. It's about understanding yourself and raising your awareness. So this assessment grades you against nine triggers. They're called hot buttons. And they're the nine common traits that mainly irritate people mostly in the workplace. So they've done a lot of research around it. And so when you do a conflict assessment, you get this report and it's able to tell you what your triggers are. So they're a bit like your Achilles tendons. So if, for example, you've got a hot button around micromanaging, it's about unpacking that. Go deep into the levels. We work with a conflict coach and work out why that's a trigger for you. What's it emanating from? Because it's emanating internally from you. It's not superimposed from someone else. It's you reacting to external forces. So that's what that's all about. And you know, I work with that when I'm conflict coaching people to get them to really understand themselves better. That makes a lot of sense. A lot of sense. So now you're moving more into the conflict field, is that correct? That's right. So now I'm fully immersed into conflict and running webinars and training uh, with organisations, running sessions and webinars on how to better, uh, how to develop our conflict resolution skills, how to develop effective brain based communication, how to deal with difficult people which is a big one because, you know, we always have to deal with that high conflict or difficult person in our lives, whether it's at work, whether it's in our family. You know, so it's teaching people those effective skills that they need to help them become better communicators and build their conflict intelligence. There's a thing called conflict intelligence. Well, that's what I like to call it because, you know, we talk about emotional intelligence with our soft skills yeah. and I, I like to call it conflict intelligence. I recently, that's a good term. I like that. Yeah, Did you recently, coin it? Yeah, I recently ran a, um, a webinar and I called it conflict intelligence in 60 minutes. Not that you can learn it in 60 minutes. That's a bit misleading, that statement. <laughs> but you can learn a hell of a lot more than what you may have known 60 minutes earlier. <laughs> <laughs> It's yeah. 60 in 60 minutes, but you need to get know, to 100 been, to understand it properly, yeah. I know, I've been studying it for seven years, and you know, the more I study and research and train in it, I, I realise it's just such a deep topic, it's a meaningful topic, and there's so much to learn. You know, we're, we're, we're evolving forever as human beings, you never get to a point in your life where you go, I know everything. Now tell me, with um, your conflict coaching work you do in businesses, um, is that typically a one-hour session or a day session? How does it work? 
it's customised training depending on the organisation's needs. So, you know, the ideal situation is you start off by running a one or two hour session to introduce people to this topic of conflict and set the ground rules and the parameters around what we'll be covering. And then we run either intimate team workshops or one-on-one -on -one coaching. It all depends on the organisation and whether they're seeking to remedy a problem that's escalated or whether they're seeking to enhance their knowledge. So it's all customised training. In fact, I've worked with a team over a period of three or four months. Um, they originally came to me for a workplace mediation, but the conflict had really infiltrated the team and that's what we find in workplaces. By the time people have come to us, Ken, for a mediation, it's almost too late. The conflict has been going on in the team for six to 12 months. It's expanded in nature. People are all aware of it. They're either walking on eggshells or you've got this divisional thing happening where people are on different sides. And at that point, there's no point holding a mediation for a day with two people. The organisation is better off having a trained specialist come in and training their whole team so that everyone becomes more aware of their own behaviour because it's, it's, you know, you, conflict, what happens in a, in a workplace situation is someone will come to you and say, oh, Ken, I can't believe what such and such said to me. Can you believe it? And, you know, you're, you're their ally and you'll um, back them up on it and suddenly the conflict is expanding one person at a time, yet the person that it needs to be dealt with hasn't. So that's the training. It's around empowering people to have those conversations, to have those difficult conversations in a respectful way where they can each be heard. I've noticed in my, my life that sometimes in a situation we might have a group of people and one person might be doing X, which is unacceptable to the group, and someone raises this as an issue, then the person who's doing it usually projects that someone else is doing it and blames them and makes a big deal of it. And it keeps on going and it doesn't get addressed. And what happens is that person then has a perception in their mind um, and they're looking, like we spoke about earlier, they're looking for evidence that their perception exactly. is, is reality. Which is so next mean. question I've got real quickly. Yeah. So you do one of these training sessions with an organisation over a month or whatever it is. What is the feedback at the end typically like? Oh, it's incredible. In fact, even leaving aside my, my feedback, there's been global research done with people reporting that when they undergo any formal skills training, that they are, the stats were something like 95% more confident in dealing with conflict in the future. So, you know, the people I work with report coming back to me and saying, look, you know, thank you so much because it wasn't just the workplace that I've used these skills for. I've used them in my family life, you know, with my husband, with my wife, with my children. You know, anyone mm -hmm. that's got children needs these skills. We don't have these skills. You know, we weren't taught these skills. So we need to educate ourselves and empower ourselves so that we can develop this common language, not just in the workplace, but on the home front in our personal lives. And, and training people in mediation, I get similar comments all the time. That's right, because it's the first time someone's actually probably sat there and looked at themselves, yeah, Ken, because for so long they've been thinking it's the other person's fault. You know, maybe, <laughs> maybe I'm not 100% perfect, but, you know, it's only 30% my fault and 70% the other. Um, and so what I say to my clients is that by the end of this training, you will realise that conflict doesn't happen to you, it happens from you, from you, internally from you. Well, I'm having a conflict comes with you. Conflict certainly comes with you too, absolutely. You're not you the know, only one. You're not the only one. If you say conflict is you, then it means you're the, the perpetrator. If it comes with you, it means that you, both of you are perpetrators. Yeah, well, that's right. I mean, I guess the point is... It takes two to fight. Yeah, how do you explain why you can go to a social event and someone says something and someone gets very offended, yet the other person goes, what do you mean? I, I was in that same room. You know, we, yeah, call exactly. it, we call it the two truths in mediation. You speak to one person and then you speak to another person, same set of events, but two different truths, two different realities for each because person. Because their perceptions give them their truth. That's right, because it comes from within them. I mean, it's that old, old one of like two people sitting across a table. 
you get a big piece of paper and write six on it, and, you know, number six. Stick it between them, and they'll both swear on a stack of Bibles that they're correct in what it is. One will say it's mm. definitely a six, and the other says it's definitely a nine. Yeah. That's they're both correct. Thing. They're both correct from their perspective. Yeah. Absolutely. But you've two contrary um, facts, which can't be both right, but they are both right from their perspective. That's right, and, and you just go around in a circle. Cindy Noble talks about it. Um, she, she refers to it as the merry-go-round of conflict. It's a big circle, and in her training, she does this big circle to show that we go around and around and around. Someone says something, someone doesn't agree, they get defensive, they attack, and you just keep going round and round. Yep, and, and it gets worse and worse. It's a spiral, I think. Of course, of course. you know, And then you get to that point where... There's no return and that's what we see in our family mediations and our work mediations where, you know, we try to help people in a day yet this conflict's been going on for six months, two years, five years in families. You know, it's been going on for so long and for so long people have these emotions and it's really, really hard to then say, okay, forget about what happened, let's just move on now. It's mm. really hard and it's, it's almost not fair to ask that of people. Now, you mentioned to me before this, this um, podcast, you're also developing a course in um, coaching conflict. Yes, very excited about this course. So, um, What's it called? It's called the Solve Code pro Program. So Solve, solve Code Program. So trying to solve the program and every element of Solve, S-O-L-V-E, relates to a key skill that you need in conflict. So we've broken it down to the five key skills that you need that are simple that can be implemented. And we're developing this course together with Joanne Law from the Mediation Institute. Um, we're, we're kind of 70% of the way there. So I think in two months we'll be launching. And it's really exciting wow. because, you know, it's one of the not many programs around that really go in depth like this to help people, whether they're corporate leaders, managers, you know, HR teams, whether they're individuals looking to educate themselves for their interpersonal relationships, basically giving people the skills to understand themselves better and to coach others if they want to also coach others or to engage more effectively in their interpersonal relationships. It's going to be great. So how long is the course um, designed to go for? I mean, hours ten so. modules, ten modules designed to go over ten weeks. And the estimated time commitment to it is 20 hours, so two hours a week. And it's going to be combined. It's going to be online for the training, but combined with live face-to-face -face training as well. Because, you know, we can learn things online, but it's when you really get to put it in practice that uh, the skills really set in and cement. So it's going to be definitely some face-to-face, -face, not online. Absolutely, absolutely face-to-face -face coaching and training and assessment. So and where's so this going to be held? So it's going to be hosted by the Mediation Institute. Um, in fact, last night we were talking about the marketing for it, so watch this space. We're going to be launching some marketing in the next few weeks. Cool. And we're really excited to be launching this because we really do believe that this is one of the key things to help people be happier in their work and in their home lives. So where is the face-to-face -face going to be held? So the face-to-face -face will be, um, at the moment, in, with the pandemic, we'll be doing it through Zoom. Um, but I'm, I'm a very social creature, as you know, and I love face-to-face -face, um, live events. So as soon as we get a bit more clarity around this pandemic, we'll be uh, also looking to do some face-to-face. -face. But, we'll, but at the moment, we'll be doing training via Zoom. So it can be done by Zoom? It can be done completely online via Zoom cool. for those people. And the intention of that was to also allow global reach because our research shows that there are barely any, like possibly a handful of courses, um, but barely any like ours, I say. <laughs> no room for being humble today. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> now, I like the idea of being online like that because someone in the middle of nowhere can do the course. Absolutely. And, you know, you don't have to worry about get being in a certain place if you've got children and you can do it in your own time. And, you know, we'll have a variety of online times for people to see whether it suits the mornings or nights. The goal, our goal is to educate and empower as many people globally as we can. Fantastic goal. Thank you. <laughs> so where do you see your future moving forward? 
Oh, wow. That's a big question. In the I conflict know. space only? Or? <laughs> well, we'll keep the conflict space. Keep <laughs> well, in the conflict space, my goal for this year is to really launch this course and give people that opportunity to learn more about themselves. Um, I've also got uh, a couple of books in the pipeline that um, are you know, due for, I guess, thinking about it, canvassing it, have started a little bit about it. Um, it, it one will be a book for adults, so to speak, to read about conflict. And the other is a children's book series that I'm really excited that I'm working on at the moment. Um, because like we said earlier, it's really about teaching these skills to people as early as we can. Once they're ingrained, it's very hard to change. It's certainly not you know, impossible, but it requires insight and work. And those people willing to take it on, yes, there's absolutely change and it's empowering. But also we want to focus on helping children learn these skills mm. early on. And, you know, and when, you, when you do it in children's books, it's not just the children learning, it's also the parents. Then we've suddenly got common language and we've got generations working through this problem together because conflict is a global problem. We can see it on the news, we can see it in our personal lives with you know, relationship breakdowns, with people unhappy at work and mental health issues. Conflict is a very key indicator towards people's happiness in their lives. Never a true word said. Now, how can people get in touch with you if they well, wish to engage you to do a talk at work or, or whatever? Yeah, they can get in touch with me either on LinkedIn, Vanita Demos is my profile, or through my company, which is The Mediation Company, and you can just Google mediationcompany.com.au. Really easy. Don't accidentally put meditation company when I first started <laughs> when I first started and I had an answering service answering my phone and every now and then they would answer meditation company and yes meditation can help you before you go to mediation but the URL is medit mediationcompany.com.au and look you up on, on um, LinkedIn can you spell your name so that people know how to spell it yes Venita is spelled V-E-N-I-T-A and Demos D-I-M O-S I should say it in travel language. I've recently learned how to do the global travel language. Do you, you know how to do that, Ken? No, I don't. <laughs> uh, Victor, oh, I can't remember. How does it go now? Maybe we save that for another podcast. Another podcast, yeah. <laughs> yeah, another podcast. Well, I'd like to thank you for spending the time with us today to go through a bit about conflict and where you're headed and what's happening. My pleasure. And um, maybe we can do another one in the future about um, something a bit more specialised in this area. Oh, that would be amazing. I'd love to do that. Thank you. No worries. And thank you very much for coming. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Bye for now. Bye. Hello. It's Joanne Law from Mediation Institute. I hope you enjoyed this chat between Ken and Venita uh, Demos. We're really excited about this project with uh, Venita to uh, develop the Solve Coach training program and release it uh, sometime in uh, 2021. This is the first podcast um, resuming our approach of having a, a bit of a, a, a random chat with specialists and uh, mediators about their approaches and what they're um, working on. We'll also continue the basic skills um, type podcast that we've, uh, Ken and I have been uh, doing. So You'll have a, a, a bit of a mixture coming through on the stream. We hope you enjoy. If there is anything uh, that you'd really like us to cover, please let us know and like and subscribe the podcast so that you can be notified of the next episodes as they come out.